Thanks, Sean. Okay. Well, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. I guess to all of you from all across the spectrum of time zones that are joining us today. This is our third year of programming under GemQuest, and our goal is to create high quality educational information uh, available to people who are interested in learning more uh, without any, any connections, uh, commercial or otherwise. So we're nonpartisan and nonprofit. And that goal, I think, has been, uh, it's a lofty goal of us, but it's, uh, it's, it's one that we've been hopefully successful in over the past almost three years now. So what we've tried to do over the years is to get um, access to information from the world's leading experts in various aspects of gemology to share with you the most up-to-date and most interesting information. And I, I thought that today, what we would do is look at, this is the final sector of the diamond series. And this one was looking uh, to look at uh, diamond treatments and their detection. And I'm hoping with the level uh, of uh, information that most of you already have, that you'll find that what we're gonna learn today will be very helpful to you in the field, uh, in the business, um, because this is one of the, I mean, when I, a long time ago, a colored diamond was, was a colored diamond not anymore um, so uh, and also um, on it that's how it was graded so with all the little tricks and and uh, treatments that are out there right now it begins becomes a little more difficult to ascertain easily uh, whether the diamond you got is what it looks like so really that information we learned today will be helpful to everybody in their their uh, understanding of the real evaluations of the diamonds they have and the qualities of them and, and ways and means of um, determining whether they've been treated in any way or not to enhance value. So in keeping with the quality of speakers we've had in the past, we've recalled someone from our very first session in November 2022, and that is Dr. Sally Mag Magania, who's been at the Gemological Institute of America for 17 years. And she doesn't look like she's been there long enough unless she's joined at 12. <laughs> I've <laughs> uh, been re researching aspects of the natural diamond color and color and diamond physics, along with identification of treatments, laboratory drone diamonds. She obtained her PhD in chemical engineering in Case Western Reserve University, studying various growth methods of chemical vapor, vapor deposition, CVD, diamonds. She has written extensively on various di natural diamonds, particularly type 2B, blue diamonds, pink diamonds, and green diamonds colored by irradiation related de defects. And she's also published several articles describing color treatments, a laboratory grown protein at GIA. So I want to very warmly welcome Sally to our midst. And I hope that you guys will all enjoy what she's going to teach us today. Thank you very much for doing what you've done and taking the time today, Sally. Thank you, Ray. And it's my pleasure to be here. I always love to talk about diamonds. And so I'm very happy to have this opportunity to uh, discuss one of my favorite topics, uh, something that I do uh, a lot, uh, just you know, a huge aspect of what I do every day when I'm at GIA. And that is uh, looking at uh, diamonds of unknown origin, diamonds submitted by clients, and then taking spectroscopy, taking gemology, uh, putting all that together and uh, determining whether this stone is uh, natural treated or laboratory grown. And so that's, uh, so I get to play a detective uh, every day. And uh, this is uh, what I'm presenting here today is a huge part of what I, of what I uh, practice on a daily basis. So gemology and uh, determining the origin of a stone is uh, very important for a variety of reasons. For example, this red stone I'm showing on the screen, depending on uh, what material it is, what the origin of it is, can have a huge difference in its, uh, its, in its approximate value. So what we do as gemologists is definitely very important for the, the gem industry and ensuring the trust of the gem buying public. So diamonds uh, come in a wide variety of colors. What we uh, often see 
uh, in jewelry stores are those that are colorless or near colorless. Uh, what you know, there's also a huge variety of stones that come out of the ground. You know, some that have a yellow or brown. Not all of those are chosen for a, uh, for cu cutting and fastening. And then we have a huge array of uh, cu fancy colored diamonds that are possible. Uh, a lot of what we're looking at when we discuss color in diamond is we're looking at a number of different possibilities. Uh, first of all, uh, we can get color due to the presence of impurity atoms, such as uh, nitrogen or boron. And the presence or absence of these are very important for determining its diamond type. And um, I'll be discussing that a lot more. I'll be discussing the different definitions for it, but also emphasizing the importance of it throughout this talk. Uh, we also have uh, intrinsic lattice defects, uh, such as vacancies, and those can contribute to a green color in diamond. And, and then finally, we have uh, various combinations of defects. For example, if you have 50 or 60 vacancies that congregate together, instead of it creating a green color, it instead it creates this brownish color as it absorbs across a wide range of uh, visible spectrum. Uh, we also have plastic deformation features uh, that creates these rather broad extended defects. We don't fully know what comprise those, uh, but those also help lead to brown to pink color in diamond. And then if you have a single nitrogen and a single vacancy, uh, and if those combine together, then you can get a pink color in diamonds. And most uh, treated pink diamonds or laboratory grown pink diamonds do get their color from having this combination of a nitrogen and a vacancy atom together. So we're gonna talk quite a bit about diamond type um, and just go quickly through those. On the upper left, I have a diamond with uh, no detectable impurities within the infrared absorption spectrum. And uh, this is generally considered the, the most pure chemically type of diamond that is available. Um, on the upper right, we have a diamond that has a, a single boron atoms and we classify those as type 2B. There's no evidence of nitrogen in either type 2A or type 2B diamonds in the infrared absorption spectra. You can find nitrogen by other, uh, by other methods and other uh, testing, uh, but for this we're limited uh, to what's detected in the infrared absorption spectra. If we do find nitrogen, then it's uh, subdivided based on whether the, the nitrogen atom is uh, uh, single and isolated, and we classify those as type 1B, or if they've uh, congregated into pairs, which we call type 1AA, or if they have four nitrogens in a vacancy, which we call type 1AB. Uh, here's some example infrared absorption spectra. On the, on the upper left, we have an example for a type one diamond. Uh, I'm showing here in this box, uh, what we are looking for within the nitrogen region. If we have any nitrogen related defects, it's gonna occur within this portion of the spectrum. Um, and on the bottom, we have a type two diamond, or two examples of a type two in which we have no evidence of nitrogen in that, uh, in that region of the spectrum, but we look at a different part to determine if it's type 2B, meaning it has boron, which has a strong peak of 2800 wave numbers, and if that's absent, then we classify it as a type 2A. Now within the nitrogen region, uh, we can look at that to determine how, how the nitrogen is put, uh, put together, how it's congregated, whether we have single nitrogen or if we have those paired up. And it's important to know that because depending on how that nitrogen is congregated will determine a lot about what pathways are possible, what colors are possible, what the, and what the treatment history and the growth history could be. So here we're looking at several different color centers in diamond. And these are all important because they are either possible, uh, because some of these are possible to be produced naturally and some can be produced within a laboratory. So it's good to know what are these uh, specific defects and how they can be produced. Um, and more importantly, what uh, can be produced naturally, uh, such as plastic deformation defects, and what can be produced within a laboratory, such as GR1, H3, and the nitrogen vacancy center. So the GR1 
is a, a single a neutral vacancy, and that contributes to a green color in diamond. Uh, this H3 defect is two nitrogen atoms that's separated by a vacancy, and that creates a green to a yellowish green, uh, a, a yellowish green to a yellow color in diamonds. On the bottom left, we have the N3 defect. Uh, that's three nitrogens with a vacancy. And this also contributes, uh, creates that well-known blue fluorescence that we see so often in colorless and near colorless diamonds. Uh, this is also the dominant feature in Cape diamonds, which are probably the most common effects, uh, absorption defects seen in natural diamonds. And then on the right, uh, the, the lower right, we have nitrogen vacancy centers, which is a single nitrogen with a vacancy that have combined together. And that gives you a pink to red color. Okay, and then over on the right, we have some plastic deformation defects, which contribute pink, uh, pink to red to a brown color in natural diamonds. Okay, um, how did we first start to detect uh, what possible treatments were performed in these stones? Well, we can go back to uh, the early model spectroscopes in which they were looking at uh, natural yellow cape diamonds and looking to see what the spectroscope reading was, and then comparing with diamonds that were known treated, such as this irradiated anneal diamond. And they saw that the presence of uh, many more lines in the in the spectroscope uh, readings for that irradiated anneal diamond. And that was some of the earliest ways that were used to determine a treatment in stones. Um, since then, we've gotten a, uh, we've moved from that 1D spectroscope readout to this 2D world of looking at wavelength versus absorbance. And this provides a much more detailed picture than what we can read from that spectroscope reading. But it's we're looking at the same overall picture. We're looking at uh, peaks and bands uh, within the absorption spectrum. There's what they did many years ago with the spectroscope. So I'm showing numerous different absorption spectra on the screen. I'm just going to go through them each one by one. So this uh, top spectrum, this is a natural diamond with plastic deformation. And for that, we have a broad band at 550 nanometers. Uh, we know this originates from plastic deformation while that diamond undergoes these uh, strong geologic forces such as mountain building events while it's deep within the earth. We don't know the specific configuration for it. Like, um, like some of the things on a previous slide where we showed that the H3 defect was two nitrogens and a vacancy. Uh, we know that for H3, we don't know what are the chemical components and the impurities um, or the intrinsic defects that are involved specifically with that plastic deformation. We, can, we can't write out the diamond lattice defects for this as yet. So that's one thing that we're working on researching right now. Um, uh, this next slide, I'm sorry, this next spectrum is for a green diamond that has been irradiated. And that irradiation creates this GR1 peak in the uh, the red to near infrared. And uh, when coupled with nitrogen related defects that absorb within the blue, that creates a window within the green. So in order to have this green color in uh, irradiated diamonds, you not only have to have the irradiation, but you also have to have those nitrogen related defects that we see in about 95% of natural stones. Um, if we don't have that irradiation, instead we just have those nitrogen related defects, those cape features, then we have absorption only within the blue, and that gives this yellowish color to a stone. And then if instead we don't have like any specific peaks, um, which we can read off very well, we just have this broad absorption going from the high wavelengths to the low wavelengths, then that creates a brown color. And we see that uh, is due to vacancy clusters. So just a quick summary about how we read absorption. Let's go through this really quick, as you may be already aware. Um, along the x-axis, we're looking at wavelength. Along the y-axis, we're looking at absorbance. And then if we want to know uh, what is causing the color in diamonds, then we read the peaks. If we want to know what is the color of the diamond, what is transmitting to the eye, then we read the valleys. So both, uh, both the peaks and the valleys are important to know what is happening in the stone and its color. 
So for yellow diamonds, uh, we have four major causes of color for those. Uh, some can be uh, created by treating and some are uh, cannot be. So it's good to know, um, you know when you look at a yellow diamond, you can't tell just from looking at it whether it is treated. You really need to know what are the defects creating that yellow color. So for example, we have uh, this yellow diamond with uh, cape features and the uh, on stone, uh, natural defect. Uh, down uh, on the bottom left, we have a, a yellow diamond with uh, the 480 nanometer band. Uh, this is another feature which we don't fully know the origin of, but we know that this is also only present in natural untreated stones. And then over on the right, we have features that can be treated uh, or introduced into the stone. These can also be natural. So for these, we have to do a lot more assessing of, is this a treated, is this a, or is this a natural stone? Because we can see this both in these features in the spectra, both in treated and natural diamonds. So for example, this upper right, we have a yellow diamond that has a high amount of that H3 defect. Uh, you may remember from the previous slide that the H3 is two nitrogens with a vacancy. And then on the bottom right, we have uh, diamonds that have that are colored by isolated nitrogen, those that are type 1B. Uh, and those um, can be uh, natural, sometimes very young diamonds um, are type 1B. But it's also something that can be introduced uh, by treatment or created within the laboratory. Uh, among pink diamonds, uh, the, those colored by the 550 nanometer band, uh, this uh, feature cannot be introduced by treatment. So uh, these are generally uh, considered uh, safe or natural. Uh, this is it's a different story with those colored by nitrogen vacancy defects. The vast majority of pink diamonds that are colored by nitrogen vacancy defects are either treated or laboratory grown. So we do a lot of in-depth analysis into these to determine what the proper origin is. Uh, we can also have uh, color due to hydrogen related defects. Um, we don't fully know all of the chemical structures for uh, features related to these. Um, for example, these violet diamonds, we have two broad absorption bands that occur in both of these and in these stones. And uh, these are principally sourced from the argyle mine. Um, uh, hydrogen impurities can also cause absorption uh, in the near in, in near infrared. And when balanced by nitrogen related defects that absorb in the blue, that creates a transmission window within the green. So a lot of these diamonds can have a greenish color due to hydrogen impurities. We Again, we don't fully know what the specific structure is for those stones. We can also get color from inclusions. Uh, for example, both fancy white and fancy black diamonds uh, typically get their color from these clouds of fine inclusions. Uh, sometimes with uh, particularly fancy white diamonds, uh, it can be inclusions. It can also be disruptions within the diamond lattice that can happen while the stone is deep within the earth. There's a lot of uh, uh, <clears throat> diamonds that are type 1AB di uh, that have uh, that, are um, that are fancy white. And a lot of these have been determined as that due to either the presence of uh, nano inclusions or to uh, disruptions in the, uh, the diamond lattice. You can also have uh, fractures that are filled with natural materials such as iron oxide, and that can impart a color to the diamond as well. One of the major tools that we use in the gemological laboratory to uh, help determine all of these different treatments is a photoluminescence analysis. Uh, this is great for a number of reasons. One is, is that uh, in this we use a laser uh, and we have lasers that are available that are from the ultraviolet up through the near infrared and that shines on the laser and then we read the emission that comes off of that stone. And it's good for a number of reasons. One is that we can, since we have lasers going from the ultraviolet up to the near infrared, we can look across a broad range of the electromagnetic spectrum to see the, you know, a lot of what's happening within the stone. Also, this photoluminescence analysis, it has a level of detection far greater than what is possible with absorption spectroscopy. 
So for example, a type 2A diamond has no nitrogen that's visible in the infrared absorption spectrum, but we can see that nitrogen in the photoluminescence because with uh, these analyses, we can re detect down to the part per billion and sometimes maybe the part per trillion level. And so we can find a lot of defects and peaks in the features in these stones that help us create a fingerprint and a method of identification. Um, some of these features, we know what they are. For example, this feature at not 575 nanometers, we've identified it as the neutrally charged nitrogen vacancy center. Uh, the feature at 637 is the negatively charged nitrogen vacancy center. There's other peaks over here on the right. We don't know what those are. We have not yet determined the atomic structure for those peaks. Uh, I mean, we do know what the H3 defect is, but some of these other features, uh, we have not uh, uh, we have not yet identified what all of those are. And but still, we can start to even if we don't know what the identification for some of these peaks are, we are still able to have them as contributors to a story that uh, it's something that we see in natural diamonds or it's something that we see in treated or uh, laboratory grown stones. Uh, we can also use uh, fluorescence, and <clears throat> this is uh, a, um, uses the similar principle as the photoluminescence that I showed on the previous slide. Uh, it's a little bit different because instead of using a laser, we often use a uh, a lower uh, Lower light, um, a lower energy light source. Uh, we're also typically running these at room temperature, whereas photoluminescence we run it at liquid nitrogen temperature or, or minus 196 degrees Celsius. Okay. So one of the things that we're looking at with treated diamonds and with natural diamonds too, and what the impetus is for uh, treating a stone is we have these natural. Uh, <clears throat> the source of natural diamonds. And depending on what the color is, we value the market value of it can vary wildly. Uh, for example, uh, D color, uh, colorless diamonds can command a very good price. As we go towards something that has a uh, higher and higher amount of color, then that market value decreases until we get to what we call you know, Z color, where we have uh, these lightly colored yellow to brown colors. When we uh, increase our color saturation, uh, that market value will increase quite a bit uh, until we can have uh, natural diamonds that have per care prices of greater than, than a million or a few million dollars. So for treated diamonds, uh, what they're hoping to do is take some of these low market value stones and see if they can try to get uh, make it more valuable. It's not. It's certainly not as valuable as their natural diamond counterparts, but they still have more uh, more value inherently than uh, some of the lower value natural stones. So they're going to take some of those lower value natural diamonds and treat them either to decolorize them and send them towards the D portion of the scale, or to add more color and add them towards this treated color end of the scale and make them more commercially marketable. So uh, a lot of the color that we see in natural diamonds, that can happen while the stone is deep within the earth, or it can happen uh, after that stone has been brought up to the near surface region and is exposed to uh, natural sources of irradiation, or it can happen after that stone has been excavated from the earth and is now above the earth, and then uh, it can be treated. So we have a couple of different, uh, and be treated in these uh, different treatment facilities. Where we're showing here, uh, for example, an HPHT react, uh, uh, reactor. So we're gonna go through, uh, uh, I show here on the screen, some of the clarity treatments that we'll be uh, going through today. On the left, I have some clarity treatments, some that we consider stable, such as internal laser drilling, and laser drilling, and those that we consider unstable, such as fracture filling. And then on the right, uh, we have uh, color treatments, uh, those that we consider stable, such as artificial radiation, uh, HPHT processing, and a treated color or multiple treatment. That's usually a combination of HPHT annealing, artificial radiation, and then sometimes some uh, low temperature annealing after that irradiation. 
And then uh, coding would be considered an unstable treatment. So here I show a timeline of uh, some of the color and clarity treatments that have developed uh, since the early 1950s. Uh, on the color side, we have a radiation and annealing um, and surface coatings that uh, started around 1950 to 1970. Around HP, around 2000, we started to see HPHT annealing uh, start to be more prevalent. Um, and we started to see after that uh, more, more and more variety of treatments as people got more cre creative with and more experimental with what they could do. Uh, and some of the goals, some of the initial goals were to reproduce rare colors, to create a red color diamond, something that's very rare naturally. And then later on, we start to see uh, some multi-step treatments, which only intention was to try to fool gem labs or to try to pass off a treated uh, diamond as a natural stone. And then on the right, uh, we have a uh, uh, some the timeline for the clarity treatments, uh, the laser drilling in the 1970s and 80s, and then that's also when glass filling started. And then about 2000 is when we started to see internal laser drilling. Okay, so laser drilling, um, that's like I said, that started in the 1970s. Uh, diamond manufacturers uh, uh, use that to disguise or to eliminate dark inclusions. Uh, in this process, a laser is used to drill a tiny, uh, tiny tunnel. Uh, it's thinner than a strand of hair by heating an area of that diamond until it evaporates. Uh, this produces a, a tube directed towards that inclusion. Uh, this tube or this laser drill hole is then filled with bleach or acid to etch out that inclusion or to vaporize it with a laser. Uh, this process will lighten a dark inclusion, which can make that diamond more marketable. Uh, while laser drilling, uh, it does disguise an existing uh, inclusion or can also eliminate it. It doesn't always improve the color grade. Um, the drill hole itself uh, becomes a clarity characteristic. Um, although typically a drill hole is not considered a durability issue. Okay. And then in the early 2000s, uh, a new laser treatment uh, for diamonds was reported in the trade, um, and this is now known as internal uh, laser drilling. Uh, and here, instead of drilling a hole, a laser beam is focused on or near the targeted inclusion, and the heat from that laser expands the inclusion, which creates enough stress in the diamond that existing cleavages will expand, uh, and possibly new ones formed around the inclusion. And then once that inclusion reaches the diamond surface, it provides a path for that acid or bleach uh, to dissolve the dark inclusion. Okay. So um, how can you detect these? Uh, you might be able to detect it with 10x magnification, but typically higher, a higher magnification is often necessary. Um, you can often detect these laser drill holes from edge channels. Uh, edge channels are natural hollow tube-like uh, features in some diamonds, but the laser drill holes are circular, while edge channels are angular. They're square, triangular, or hexagonal. Um, reflecting light off a diamond's facet uh, allows um, you know, for you to see uh, the, the opening uh, for the laser drill hole. And then one other method, um, one that we consider to be, uh, that I mentioned as an unstable, considered to be an unstable treatment on my prior slide was uh, glass filling. Uh, the idea for this is that the filler glass has a close match in the refractive index of the host diamond. Um, it's closer to the host diamond than air. Uh, the refractive index is closer to diamond than air is. And so that makes it, uh, Less, uh, less easy to see uh, the fracture within the stone, okay? Um, one of the best ways to detect it is by looking for that flash effect. Um, this occurs because glass uh, fillers don't precisely match the diamond's RI uh, at all wavelengths of light. And so it is visible under magnification 
in both bright and dark field lighting. Although really, uh, I found that fiber optic illumination um, makes the flash effect more evident. Um, and then other signs of fracture filling can include just things you would expect to see in glass, such as gas bubbles or flow structure. Um, this slide shows uh, um, sort of a global uh, all-encompassing thing of what's possible if you follow different treatment pathways uh, to change the color. Um, and a lot of these will depend on what is the starting material, what is the initial color of the stone, but also what is the initial diamond type. And so the different pathways that the stone can take, whether you're looking at surface coating or HPHD treatment or radiation or a combination, all of these different colors are possible. But ultimately, the final color is um, <clears throat> most often rooted with what are the different treatments you're using and what is the starting material. Uh, so coatings uh, are, you know, you know, people have been you know, using coding, you know, less sophisticated coatings for centuries, but uh, we really started to see more sophisticated within like the 1950s or 1960s, uh, where they would use uh, these multiple thin surface coatings that um, use calcium fluoride or gold, uh, silicon. The best way to determine if a stone has been coated is by looking at it in magnified reflected light. Um, we also have sometimes uh, people will put coating on to try to uh, eliminate a perceived body color. For example, uh, blue ink on a facet to try to lessen a yellow appearance by putting on a complementary color. Sometimes people will put on a coating to try to enhance a pre-existing color. For example, uh, this was a UV visible absorption spectrum for a uh, pink diamond that had uh, some red ink on it to try to enhance that uh, a color. Um, so with the coating on it, it had a fancy color grade of fancy intense purple pink. And then when that uh, red ink coating was removed, uh, the, the final grade was a fancy purple pink. Uh, we think that uh, they knew that that color was not permanent and would not survive very long, but they, I think they hoped that it would get through the color grading process. And so then they would have that official color grade. Um, and, and then the rest of the gemology would support a pink color grade, even if it did not support a fancy intense color grade. Uh, here's some other examples of some coatings that we've seen on uh, different diamonds. Uh, again, the best uh, way to tell is to look for wear and tear along facets or at facet junctions uh, on these coated stones in reflected, while well, looking at them in reflected light. Uh, when we're looking at more stable treatments, um, uh, stable color treatments, uh, it can be a little bit difficult just from the gemology to be able to tell the difference or by looking at them uh, just at their color. You can see it from these side-by-side -side images that uh, natural and treated diamonds often have a very similar color appearance. Um, and so that's what makes uh, sending these to a gemology lab so important because uh, uh, we will have all of those spectroscopy tools that I showed earlier to help us uh, along with that database treated, no, known laboratory grown, no naturals, to help us have that fingerprint for what is a treated stone, what is a natural stone. And also uh, we have, uh, when a new treatment is seen, we often will see it very early and, and we will recognize it very early as a new treatment. So it's uh, um, often very good to have a gemological laboratory uh, verify the color origin for a stone. So one thing I want to talk about is types of irradiation. Um, these are types that can be uh, introduced uh, in a laboratory, but also uh, naturally within the earth. For example, this Dresden green on the far right, uh, this diamond is about uh, 40, um, 
I believe it's about 44 carats, and it has a full green body color. Uh, that's uh, very unusual to have uh, a diamond that has uh, such pronounced radiation through the full body of, of the stone. The reason for that is um, we most often see uh, radiation in the form of alpha, and that has a very shallow penetration depth. And so we can often see diamonds that have like a green skin or have some radiation stains, but those are not often present within the final facet of gem. In order to get something that has like, um, creates body color within the green diamond, you need to have beta and gamma radiation. And those are far more uh, rarely seen within nature. Okay. Uh, if we wanna do it in the laboratory, uh, we can uh, simulate uh, both the alpha, beta, and gamma radiation, but what is typically done is the beta, where we use an electron. And <clears throat> um, that's a, typically a radiation today, uh, done with it for treatment is done using uh, these e-beam uh, facilities. And so what they do is they use an electron accelerator such as the one in this photo. It rains down electrons onto these diamonds, usually table side down, cool it side up. And so that cool it receives the highest amount of radiation. And sometimes we can see that result gemologically such as having these pronounced concentrations of color at the cool it. Uh, also, because this can generate high amounts of heat, uh, they have a cooling water going through the, uh, underneath the stone to keep it, uh, to keep the stone cool um, and help create some consistency from diamond to diamond on what the final uh, irradiation treatment is. So when they irradiate, when, when, when in nature, or when the laboratory irradiates a stone, uh, what happens is that it knocks a carbon atom out of its home position um, and it creates a vacancy uh, behind. It also creates an interstitial, but, uh, but for right now, we're just gonna focus on that vacancy that's created. Uh, it absorbs light at wavelengths above 550 nanometers. And depending on whether you have nitrogen in the stone, uh, that will often create a green color. Or if you have very high amounts of radiation or there's no nitrogen, as it's say it's a type two, then uh, the resulting color will be blue. So this is an example of what the GR1 spectrum looks like in a type two stone. Uh, you can see that there's no nitrogen related absorption uh, in this diamond. And so that creates, it has a transmission window uh, within the blue to greenish blue. And uh, the major absorption uh, due to those uh, introduced vacancies is up in the yellow to red portion of the spectrum. Uh, certainly this uh, trying to distinguish naturally irradiated from laboratory irradiated is one of the biggest challenges that we have. It's been an issue for us going back decades and it's still an issue for gemological laboratories today. Uh, we're still working on it. We're still constantly performing research to try to distinguish natural versus laboratory radiation. And we've certainly made some great strides, but there are still some diamonds that come in that can be, uh, that can be challenging. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that laboratory and natural radiation uh, can impart the uh, very similar or near identical defects within the diamond. Uh, since both a laboratory and natural radiation happens at uh, low temperatures, um, then it, uh, a lot of the same defects are uh, created within the stones. You know, like I said, we can also have natural radiation. Uh, and so this is showing some of the examples of those uh, we, where we can have radiation stains uh, caused by alpha, alpha radiation either from surface contact with radioactive grains or minerals or radioactive fluids that seep into cracks. This is a fabulous image of, of uh, radioactive fluids that have left behind its mark within these cracks. Um, here's on the upper left is a stone that has both alpha damage with, radi with surface radiation stains, but also has a greenish body color, uh, uh, likely due to the other forms due to beta or gamma radiation. And then on the bottom, have uh, uh, both 
green and brown radiation stains. Uh, as rate, uh, when these diamonds have been exposed to high temperature or have been exposed to slightly high temperature for geologic time scales, that can slowly turn these green radiation stains from green to brown. Uh, we can see that a lot in both natural stones, or we can also see it in diamonds that have been uh, heated after they came up to the surface. Okay, uh, so this is one example of some of the research that we've been doing into these radiation stains and into uh, trying to distinguish natural and just learning more about naturally radiated stones. Uh, here we uh, collected a map, uh, a photoluminescence map where we shined a laser and we rastered, rastered it across the surface where we collected thousands of spectra in order to compile a heat map of where we're seeing very high levels of GR1. Now you're seeing um, that over on the right is a detailed image of, uh, of the map that we're seeing within this region. And one thing you notice is that this area that has the very dark uh, uh, radiation stain, it doesn't appear to have any GR1. Uh, that's just, uh, there is plenty of GR1 there, but it's not being detected very well because of the amount of damage that to the surface region of that part of the diamond. Uh, here in the other parts close to that, we are able to see uh, that, that GR1 uh, uh, in higher concentrations than in the colorless parts of the stone. Uh, we're also able to see that zone width or the width of that GR1 penetration is about uh, 20 microns. So that uh, tell, gives us an indication of how far that uh, GR1 intensity will penetrate into the stone. So here's an example of what happens when we uh, irradiate a diamond. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we can uh, cause it to change uh, color from a yellow to a pink or alternatively into more of an orange brown. Again, that final color it depends a lot on what that initial, uh, the, the initial defects are within the diamond. For example, let's say we have this type 1A diamond and it has a uh, single nitrogen pairs. Okay. What happens if we irradiate it? It's going to uh, uh, turn this diamond green due to the introduced vacancies that are now present in the stone. Okay, but now we have the, now we have these pre-existing uh, uh, nitrogen pairs, and we have vacancies. So if we anneal, that's going to uh, anneal the diamond, heat it up at about six to eight hundred degrees Celsius. It's going to cause these vacancies to move, and we're going to create new defects. So when we anneal that stone, those vacancies move and creates H3 as a result. And so that causes this uh, previously sort of like a, a weak T color uh, type 1A diamond to become this vibrant, uh, vibrant yellow diamond. Uh, it's definitely something that looks far more appealing, has a much higher color saturation. And that's because the treaters um, manipulate, knew what were the atoms in the diamond and how to manipulate those to create this final color. So when you irradiate an anneal of stone, you can take something that's like this S to T color yellow diamond and, a, and, and transform it into this fancy intense yellow. Um, you can also see that it create, uh, creates a lot of other uh, gemological evidence of that treatment. For example, on the left, we have what it looked like before the treatment. Uh, the fluorescence was dominated by N3, by that blue fluorescence. And then after treatment, we see a high amount of that green due to the creation of H3. And that H3 causes this uh, green fluorescence in the stone. So what happens instead if we have a type 1B diamond? Instead of starting off with uh, nitrogen pairs, now we're starting off with single nitrogen. Okay, so we have a type 1B diamond. It's a brownish color, not very saleable. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to irradiate it and anneal it. So first, let's irradiate it. And as expected, we're going to turn this diamond into a green color due to the introduced vacancies. Yeah, and now we have GR1, we also have the single nitrogen, 
and that creates this greenish color. But uh, with these raw material, but with these uh, materials of the single nitrogen and the vacancies, if we anneal this diamond, then these vacancies are going to migrate to those single nitrogen and create nitrogen vacancy pairs. Okay. And when we do that, instead of this diamond turning this that vibrant canary yellow, it's going to turn this beautiful pink color, because that nitrogen vacancy center is what giving is giving that diamond its pink color. So here's uh, an example of what ha uh, what happened with the visible absorption spectra as we went through those treatments. So first, the untreated type 1B diamond, it has um, an absorption spectrum similar to what you'd expect for a brown diamond. However, we know from its infrared absorption spectra that it has that single nitrogen. And so um, once we irradiate it, uh, we, we create that GR1 in the diamond. Uh, we keep uh, all of the other features absorption spectrum identical. We didn't change any of that. But then when we anneal those single nitrogens uh, that we knew were there from the infrared absorption and then that and the vacancies are going to combine up. We're going to drastically reduce the amount of GR1 because those are now part of this uh, NB center. And then now that's creating this vibrant pink color in the stone. Uh, HPHT annealing uh, or uh, temperature treatment uh, that takes place at high pressures and high temperatures, uh, similar to um, you know, it's at about the same pressure, but at higher temperatures than what you'd expect for growth conditions for a natural gem diamond. It's also the exact same equipment that you can use to produce uh, HPHT laboratory grown diamond. So um, it is the same treatment. I mean, sorry, it is the same reactor. It is the same equipment, but it should not be confused with HPHT laboratory grown uh, diamond. Uh, instead, this is a treatment that is done to uh, alter the color of a previous, previously grown diamond, either natural or CVD. Okay. But it can cause uh, dramatic changes in the stone uh, when it's heated to these high temperatures for just a few minutes. Uh, this is some examples of some of the what happens to the diamond when it comes out of the reactor or out of the HT, HPHT chamber. Often you see this frosting on the surface, uh, which would need to be uh, re, uh, re, uh, repolished and removed. Uh, sometimes the polishers don't get all of that. So sometimes you can see remnants of this frosting on a couple of the facets. Also, if the treaters don't choose well. If they choose a stone with uh, some clarity features or inclusions in them, then those do not do well with the high pressure, high temperature treatment. And so you can have um, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the diamonds not fare well when they come out of the HPHT reactor. So the, uh, the people that are treating these diamonds and choosing diamonds for HPHT treatment to choose very well. They have to know the diamond type so that they know what the final color is. And then they also need to know what the clarity features are in the stone because they can't choose anything that has a uh, very poor clarity to begin with because they will not like the results. Um, one of the reasons why we need to know what the diamond type is before we put the stone into the reactor is that we will know what, ex what results to expect when it comes out. Uh, when and it with the HPHT treatment. For example, along the top row, we have five different diamonds, and um, <clears throat> and you can see uh, that all, all of these are all of these are natural diamonds. And then after HPHT treatment, the results are dramatically different depending on what the diamond type of the stone was. For example, uh, this stone on the far left. Uh, this is a type 2 or a type 1AB diamond that when you HPHT treat it, it will decolorize and can go towards a D color. This is a type 2B diamond. Uh, most likely it's a weak uh, gray color. And when you HPHT treat that, uh, instead of it removing the brownish color, it removes the gray color that's also due to plastic deformation that allows you to see the, uh, the blue color that's also exists within that stone. 
Uh, for example, over here, this is also a type 2A diamond, uh, but with a pink, that is a pink to brown color. And when you remove that brown color, you allow that pink color to become more apparent. So here is a brown type 2A diamond. And when we HPHT treat that, uh, that causes those vac uh, the vacancy clusters to be broken apart and, um, and also causing that brown color to disappear. So the plastic deformation that causes the brown to gray color in type 2, uh, type 2B, I'm sorry, type 2A, type 2B, and type 1AB diamonds uh, can be removed by that HPHT processing. And there are some uh, visual characteristics that can be seen in those diamonds. And so here we show a, a flow of what can you know, perhaps be uh, seen when you HPHT process a diamond. Um, after the treatment, it will need to be repolished. And for this stone, it went from a fancy brown yellow to an H color after HPHT treatment. Uh, here, I show uh, some absor uh, absorption spectra on the left and photoluminescent spectra on the right of what happens when we decolorize uh, one of these stones <clears throat> uh, with the HPHT treatment. On the left, we show what happens in the absorption spectra. Uh, in the untreated stone, we have this uh, uh, broad absorption band due to the vacancy clusters. Uh, across a la large portion of the visible spectrum. With the HPHT treatment, uh, that is largely uh, dispersed and you no longer have that absorption within the visible wavelengths, uh, leading to that colorless result. On the right, we have what occurs with photoluminescent spectroscopy. Uh, and with the HPHT treatment, we see a reduction or an elimination in many, if not all, in many of these peaks. We have a reduction in the NV centers in uh, plastic deformation related features and many others that are present within the stone. All of those are reduced or eliminated by that HPHT processing. So one question you may have is if a colorless or near colorless diamond is type 1A, but not, um, but not the, the rare type 1AB, um, then we're comfortable to include it as natural. Uh, just from knowing that diamond type uh, and, and that it's colorless and near colorless, we're comfortable to include it as natural. So why is that? Uh, well, I'm gonna go over that on the next few, few slides. And I'm gonna do that by asking, could we decolorize natural type 1A diamonds by HPHT processing? Or can we decolorize laboratory grown type 1AB diamonds by HPHT processing? The answer to both is no. So that's why we're comfortable to conclude these uh, type 1A uh, colorless type 1A diamonds as natural. So let's see what happens if we did take a type 1A diamond and HPHT treat it. If we took that type 1A, HPHT treated it, it wouldn't go to colorless. It would go a vibrant yellow. Um, HPHT causes those vacancy clusters to break up and those are trapped by H3, forming H3 pairs. Um, and uh, also they can form H2 centers as well uh, up in the near infrared. Some of those nitrogen pairs will also break apart, creating single nitrogen, which also contributes to the yellow color. So if uh, so, the thing I want you to take away from this is that using HPHD processing, we cannot decolorize a type 1A diamond. And then here's an example of what happens to that type 1A diamond after we HPHD process it. Um, the <clears throat> this is the the before image, before HPHT, and then after we have the creation of H3 defects and H2 defects, and we can see that it creates this very uh, saturated yellow color. Uh, here's an example of what happens if we HPHT process some Cape diamonds, those that have the N3 and N2 defects. Uh, we can see 
that the majority of them have certainly become a more vibrant color uh, as a result. They don't desaturate, they don't decolorize. Instead, we see both of them, you know, all of them have you know, a brownish orange or a brownish yellow, an orange yellow. All of those, um, this is what to expect if you HPHT treat a type 1A cake. So what about uh, laboratory grown type, uh, HPHT grown la uh, laboratory grown diamonds? Okay, well from that, I'm gonna go back to uh, discussing about how natural diamonds are formed. Uh, when, they're, when, when natural diamonds are first formed, all they have is single nitrogens. Uh, none of those nitrogens have, have found each other and have paired up. So when young diamonds are formed deep in the earth, all of those are type 1B. All of those are yellow in color. But over the millions of years that those diamonds exist at about 1,000 degrees Celsius, those single nitrogens will gradually pair up and form those nitrogen pairs. Okay, And at those temperatures that we see for natural diamond, it only goes one way. It only goes from type 1B, uh, where you have isolated nitrogen and that yellow color, to type 1A, where you have those nitrogen pairs and it goes colorless. Okay. At the higher temperatures, the higher temperatures that we need for HPHT processing and HPHT growth. So for example, just uh, I'm just gonna take as an approximation the 1700 degrees Celsius. In that, the reaction goes both ways. You can both create nitrogen pairs and you can break apart nitrogen pairs and create single nitrogen. So for HPHT conditions at these temperatures, then the, the reaction goes both ways. So the thing I want you to take away from that is that we can um, never fully get rid of that type 1B nitrogen in HPHT grown nitrogen, in HPHT grown diamonds, because we're gonna see uh, as many pairs as we see created, we're also gonna see those destroyed and revert back to single nitrogen. So uh, I want you to, so that's a takeaway that I want you to realize that for 1A HPHT grown diamonds, they will always retain that type 1B component and that resulting yellow color. We can also have multiple treatments. Uh, that is where you take an HPHT grown, I'm sorry, an HPHT treated diamond. And then after that, you follow it up with a radiation and a nailing. And so that is one of the um, most common ways that we have treated pink to red colors in diamonds. Uh, and sometimes it can be difficult to tell which is which. So for example, these are natural colored diamonds and then these are treated colored diamonds. Now the pathway that we have for this, um, you may recall earlier I talked about how a type 1B diamond was irradiated and annealed to form a pink color. And the reason why they started with that type 1B is because they had single, that type 1B had single nitrogen. What we're doing here is we're starting with a type 1A nitrogen that has nitrogen pairs. So what they're gonna do is, and these type 1A diamonds are far more common than those uh, rare type 1B diamonds. So this is a much more common uh, source uh, uh, material than type 1B diamonds but they still need to get it to those single nitrogen in order to create the NB centers. So when they HPHC process the diamond first, that's gonna split apart those nitrogen pairs into the single nitrogen. And so now they've taken this type 1A diamond and essentially made it a type 1B. And then they can continue on with that process where they irradiate the diamond, impart vacancies, and anneal it to create single ni uh, nitrogen vacancy centers. Okay, but by doing this, they have a far more uh, common source of a type 1A diamond with single nitrogen, with, I'm sorry, with nitrogen pairs than the much rarer type 1B diamonds um, um, that are not very common in nature. So here's an example of what happens uh, uh, with a type 2 diamond. Uh, it started off as a brownish color, and and then after HPHT, it went uh, it uh, largely decolorized, and then they uh, irradiated it to a blue color. 
Now, if they had just taken this brown and gone straight to the irradiation, the, color, the final color would not have been as attractive. So that's why they did this intermediate step of the HPHT treatment to decolorize it so that that created a better canvas to irradiate and put that blue, vivid blue color instead of starting with a brown canvas. Um, in uh, and all diamonds that leave the GIE laboratory, uh, they are inscribed with treated color on the girdle, uh, so that uh, not only do they have treated color in the report, but we also inscribe treated color on the girdle. And just remember that all diamonds uh, require uh, diligence. Uh, for example, here is an, an assembly of diamonds you know, that may not be the most attractive as some of the others that I've seen, but they all they cover the gamut of all different possible origins. So thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope you've learned a couple of things that were interesting, and I'd be happy to take any questions. I just had a quick one. Is there any kind of a radiation signature that's micro detectable, possibly on stones that have been irradiated or neutral? Um, there are a number of features that are detectable and that are reliable for detection. That um, and uh, particularly in stones that have been um, uh, multi-treated and uh, to say those pink to red colors. Uh, there are a number of diamonds that can be uh, reliably de uh, determined as irradiated and some that are, can be reliably determined as natural. Uh, not all stones will fall into one of those categories, though. So there is a it's a continuum and there is that uh, a middle ground, which is which are the challenges. Are there any other questions? Um, there's some in the chat. Um, okay. So uh, I can, uh, I've opened up the chat and um, uh, uh, for example, there's one about uh, coding. Do you test first and then clean? Have you had coatings come off in the grading process? Um, and how is it handled for a GI report? Uh, yes, if if we detect that there's a coating on a GI on, on a stone, uh, we do not grade it. Uh, we would we say that there's a coating present, and we would and typically we'll uh, we'll say that there's a coating present and we'll return it to the client, and then they can decide what to do next. For example, with that diamond that had the uh, the, the red ink. Uh, in which that red ink was very unstable, very easy to clean off. Um, I believe for that, uh, we did end up issuing the grading report for the fully cleaned diamond. Um, but that, that was because the red ink would easily come off that stone. Um, but generally, if we detect a coating, the stone is returned to the client saying that the, it has this unstable coating and, uh, and we cannot issue a, a, a grading report for that stone okay i think there's a new question on chat too okay why does the diamond uh uh is, is this question why does the diamond lose carrot weight after hph treat hph treatment um that's typically because uh the diamond typically loses weight after hph treatment uh not from the treatment itself but from the polishing that's necessary uh, because of the frosting that happens on those diamond surfaces, uh, that has to be polished away. And then from that repolishing is when it loses that weight. So I hope that answers your question. Um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to read quickly. <laughs> uh, but if, if anyone wants to, uh, to speak up, then uh, please do um, with any other questions. Uh, I was taught. I was taught that treated diamonds were not allowed to be called fancy. Um, uh, they they are. They are given uh, the same uh, uh, fancy uh, treated diamonds and laboratory grown diamonds are given the uh, the same color grades. Um, you know, are and are graded on the same color grading scale as natural diamonds. And so the at least what's 
our GI report that um, it does have that color grade, uh, particularly if it's one if it's one of the stable treatments, such as HPHD treatment or radiation. Um, if it's an unstable treatment, it, we will not issue a grading report. Um, if if the diamond is determined uh, uh, to be treated, there is an asterisk next to the uh, the color grade, and then that asterisk refers you to a comment saying that this diamond has been treated or some comment to that effect. But typically with next to the color grade, there is an asterisk uh, indicating that there is some additional explanation to that color grade. So I, I hope that answers your, your question. Um, and then um, I, I, yeah, I, I liked uh, Darlene's comment that says, uh, scary what the inscrupulous can do to treat diamonds. And yes, I, I absolutely agree. Um, you know, what, what we find uh, people will do or what they'll attempt, uh, you know, not only you know, treat diamonds in order to change color, but also to try to fool gemological laboratories, you know, where they'll try to stack treatments, not, not to even change the color, but just because they think um, they'll introduce natural features back into a stone that will fool us. Um, and so uh, typically, uh, what, we'll start to see a lot of those interesting diamonds all at once and then uh, we know that they're different and we'll set those aside and uh, we'll uh, and they'll get caught and so uh, that's one of the good reasons to send a diamond to a gemological laboratory is just because we see that huge variety of natural and treated diamonds all day long. And so if something doesn't look right, either in its appearance and its gemology and its spectroscopy, then we can see that part right away. Um, it's because we take so much data uh, on the stone, you know, both in terms of spectroscopy and gemology, and we want everything to tell the same story, you know, and to tell a consistent story. We don't want gemology to say one thing and spectroscopy to say something different, you know, like for that uh, coated, like for example, that coated pink diamond um, that had that red ink on it, you know, without the red ink, it was still a pink diamond, but with the red ink, it was like fancy, intense pink. Um, so like all of the gemology was consistent with, uh, with the pink diamond. Uh, the only thing that was a little weird was that extra bump in the visible absorption spectra. And then when it's cleaned, that little extra bump went away and then uh, that color did change. So yeah, there's a lot of things that people try and that we've had to, uh, to identify and circumvent um, for sure. Um, and then I've got a question of what type is natural black diamond? Um, the uh, natural black diamonds can be almost any diamond type. Uh, typically the black color comes from inclusions, uh, such as uh, oftentimes uh, graphitic inclusions. Um, and, uh, and so what, so for that, it's not so much what's the internal chemistry of the stone, so much as what that uh, grew up, uh, what grew up around it and what got incorporated in with the stone. Um, and then what type of diamond is used to create black color by using the radiation or heating? Uh, sometimes you can create black color by high, high amount of irradiation. So much so that you put so much uh, irradiation into the stone that it just turns it black. If you look at it with fiber optic lighting, you can see a deep green color like through the coolant or through the pavilion, but, um, but it has so much um, um, uh, so, so many defects introduced that face up it looks black. Uh, and, and for that, that can pretty much be used on any diamond, any diamond type, because you're not so much as trying to use the existing chemistry in the stone as you're just completely overwhelming it with what you want to put into the diamond. Um, uh, asking if I could discuss the cost involved on the various treatments. Um, I'm actually not too familiar about cost involved with treatments. I, uh, uh, with what I do, I normally stay away from valuation, both on like natural diamonds and, you know, and then treat treatments and treated diamonds and then how much it costs to treat. Um, so I'm not as sure, uh, about that. I, I think, um, I know a lot of uh, CVD laboratory grown diamonds, a lot of those are regularly HPHT processed. 
and um, as, as just part of their regular course and as part of the growth process where they will grow CBD diamonds fast and then they grow brown as a result and then they'll HPHT process those to lighten them up. And so HPHT process, uh, and so laboratory grown diamonds don't have as high a, a, a sale price as, as their natural or treated counterparts. And so I, I can't imagine that the HPHT treatment of those CVDs is very expensive, um, but I, I'm not fully sure what those uh, costs are. Um, and then uh, I, uh, okay, I, I think I maybe answered the, did I, uh, I think I maybe answered the question for Sia, but, uh, but yes, uh, uh, treated, treated stones uh, will have the same uh, color grade scale as, as natural diamonds, um, but there will be uh, clarification very obviously on the report that, that it is a treated stone. Um, I did I answer everyone's questions. If there's more, uh, um. I, I have a uh, question I'd like to uh, ask. So you showed sure. um, a diamond where the the cullet was a more intense pink. For, sorry, like one treated with an electron beam. Yes. So, um, do you happen to know what sort of energy electron beam they would use for that? Um, typically, we. Uh, they use probably one to two MeV uh, electron. Uh, uh, one to two MeV is um, typically the uh, the energy used for that. I have seen them use up to three MeV, um, but you know, a lot of the treaters don't give us their recipes. So uh, sometimes, <laughs> yeah. So so we'll, so we'll, we'll see diamonds ourselves just as part of our research, so that we have like. A database of known treated stones, and then you know, because we're also like trying to follow defects and see what happens. Um, and so we'll we'll, we'll uh, do treatments ourselves, and 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 you know, in answer to the previous question, I never see the bills for those treatments, so I'm not sure how much that costs with the irradiation facility that we use. Um, so sorry about that, not knowing the cost for that treatment. Um, but yeah, typically we'll use about one to three MeV. Um, for our okay. for the treatments that we do. Okay, yeah. so the, a higher energy electron beam would produce a more homogeneous uh, coloring because it's yes. that's that low energy is just they're just stopping before they uh, before they get down yeah. to the pavilion and so on. Okay, yeah. so yeah. you try try a you know twenty MeV beam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't think I've ever yeah I don't think I've ever seen one that high. Um, yeah, or, or, or 10, I, I was going yeah, to yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. yes, yeah, definitely the higher would probably create a more uh, <clears throat> uh, uniform result. And uh, well, David, if you, if you st step away from diamonds, do you know anything about uh, corundum treating with, with electrons? I, Is, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I would not want to yeah, that's okay. delve so, into yeah. that. I, I would be, I, I'd be wary of giving you something, you know, but I, um, but uh, but Ray lines up okay. a lot of uh, great people, so I'm sure whoever is going to speak about uh, uh, corundum treatment will definitely be able to answer that better than than I would try okay. to, to delve thank into. You. I'm yeah. going to let you off the hook here, Sally, and okay. thank okay. you, thank everybody who attended. And I have to think, say something personal, and that is that I've watched all these programs carefully, and generally it's very hard to get people to ask questions. A testimonial to the quality of your program was the amount of questions that you generated. So you should feel quite chuffed as to the, you know, the, the, what what you accomplished today in terms of teaching. So thank you. Oh, um, great! Thank you. There, thank there you. was an illusion by Sally that I am hoping to have some a small mini series on treatments of colored stones. That's something we can look forward to. Our next program will be on April thirtieth, and I'll be announcing everybody what that's about. Um, I also want to say that uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to the services that are provided by Julian Ralph as the uh, technological back, a backup person here who uh, runs uh, Mindat.org, which is the largest mineral uh, database in the world. And, and also, he also has, and his back and called Gemdat.org, which <coughs> covers all the known gems. And it's not meant to compete with anybody else, but it does offer a very good resource. So we have to say thank you to 
Julian for his technological support here and for what he does to the world for the world with his database information that he provides. We're already got a voice here. Um, so I look forward to seeing all of you and more uh, at the end of April. And I hope you have a very good day. What's left of it for you? Thank you very much, Sally, for your contributions. They are much appreciated. Yeah. Um, my pleasure. I, I love to talk about diamonds and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very yeah, I much. I never would have guessed that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're hoping that Joanne will have this program up and available either on gemdat.org or on YouTube fairly soon. And there will be more programs coming soon uh, as, as time becomes available for Joanne to do that. So thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, audience. Have a great month ahead of us, and we'll look forward to seeing your learning experience at the end of April. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Sally. Have a good day. Thank you.